When we say charge on, we commit to do extraordinary things. It's a catalyst for action. To put in the work. To keep trying. It's a challenge. To be smarter and stronger. Charge on. It drives us to be more. To get after it every day. It's time to rise above. To let them know we're coming. Charge on. Charge on. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for today's Dean's Distinguished Lecture Series. I am Dr. Robert Tico Crows, Associate Dean for Research and Administration at the Rosen College of Hospitality Management. We honor Dr. Abraham Pizam, founding Dean of the Rosen College of Hospitality Management. 50 years ago, he achieved his PhD and the Dean's Distinguished Lecture Series will take a look at the evolution of the hospitality and tourism industry through the eyes of some of the pioneers and doyens in the field of education. For those of you who attended our first four lectures with Dr. Jafari, Dr. Reichel, Dr. King, and Dr. Anna Matilla, thank you for taking time out and being here today. For those of you who attend our distinguished lecture series for the first time, welcome. The Dean's Distinguished Lecture Series will conclude in April 2021. Today we have another interesting lecture by our guest, Dr. Pauline Sheldon. And at this point, I would like to say good afternoon and good morning to my co-host, Dr. Alan File. Good afternoon, Alan. <laughs> Lovely, thank you very much indeed, Tico, and welcome Dr. Pauline Sheldon. Always nice to introduce a fellow Brit and uh, an amazing pioneer uh, in the study of tourism, Pauline, I've read your work for years, and I think I can probably speak for most of the people that are tuning in today. Your contribution to Trinet has been immense, and I know myself, it's been a tangible positive in moving my career forward. So thank you very much indeed, for particularly for Trinet, which, which has been uh, uh, a wonderful resource for us all. Um, thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Uh, really pleased to welcome you today. Can I ask... We're going to have questions uh, at the end. I can see some questions coming in already, um, but if you can put your questions in the Q&A function, and then I will pose those to Dr. Sheldon at the end of what will be a very good presentation. I've seen it already, so I know it's excellent. Pauline, welcome to the Rosen College. Very, very nice to see you. Thank you. Dean Wong. Thank you, Alan. Um, good afternoon or good morning, everybody, depending on where you are. So welcome again to the uh, Rosen College Dean's Distinctive Lecture Series. Uh, as Alan described, uh, this uh, series is set up to honor Dr. Abraham Pizam, the founding Dean of Rosen College from 2000 to 2018. Uh, Abe is a person probably uh, um, many of us sitting here uh, already know. Um, so uh, he's the founding Dean uh, of the Rosen College, I, as, a, <clears throat> as I just mentioned. Uh, he also has some other very important uh, titles, you know, we collected over the years, so to speak, Abe, right? And just, you know, to be accurate, uh, I would like to uh, share with a sh uh, a, you know, really a short bio of Abe, uh, to be accurate. So Dr. Pizam is the founding dean of Rosen College of Hospitality Management uh, at the University of Central Florida. Uh, currently, he serves as professor and Linder Chaplin Eminent Scholar Chair in Tourism Management. Uh, Professor Pizam is widely known in the field of hospitality and tourism management and has conducted research projects, uh, lectured, and served as a consultant in more than 30 uh, countries. He has held various academic positions in uh, different countries and has authored more than 250 publications, uh, out of which 180 uh, were scientific publications, and he has published 10 uh, books. Uh, his publications have resulted in 
more than 20,000 citations and H index of 66. Uh, he's editor emeritus of the International Journal of Hospitality Management, uh, one of the premier journals in the field of hospitality and it serves on the editorial boards of 26 academic journals. Uh, Professor Pizam has conducted consulting and research projects for a variety of international, national, and uh, uh, tourism organizations. Um, so uh, we are very, very grateful today uh, to um, have another great scholar, um, uh, distinguished speaker, uh, Professor Pauline Sheldon to join us today from the University of Hawaii. Uh, Pauline is a friend of uh, APE, I don't know for how many years, but um, uh, I met Professor Sheldon probably more than 10 years ago in a beautiful Hawaii um, uh, during the uh, conference, which is called TAFI. Basically, it's a tourism uh, educator uh, research, uh, research group. Um, so uh, she has a very interesting topic today, talking about new paradigms uh, and new tourism. Uh, so I'm really interested in, uh, in, in hearing what uh, she has to say about the future of tourism, tourism research, and tourism education. Uh, because this is really a very, very crucial uh, time. Uh, maybe can also provide some validations in terms of what Rosen College is trying uh, to do. Uh, as, as you all know, uh, Rosen College uh, has been adopting a hospitality plus strategy uh, for uh, tourism, hospitality, research, and education. Uh, so this is already reflected by uh, our philosophy of treating hospitality, not necessarily as an industry, but also more importantly, as a culture which can be extended uh, into other related service areas where the culture of hospitality is, is desired, uh, covering the entire spectrum of hospitality ecosystem, I would say, uh, ranging from the traditional hospitality to hedonic hospitality, all the way to utilit utilitarian hospitality. So I think you know this philosophy and, and approach has created numerous research angles and opportunities for faculty and graduate students. Uh, the interest in the study of tourism and hospitality over the years uh, has been growing worldwide, in particular in the Asian Pacific region and expanding over the years, uh, reflected by the number of journals, uh, you know, depending on uh, who, uh, who you talk, talk with, you know, probably we have about you know, 400 journals in our field right now. And then also program students, particularly graduate students enrolled in, in a program. So this is really a, you know, a, a time of, of, of uh, major transformations and changes uh, for hospitality and tourism research and education. So um, with that, I think I'm gonna invite Abe to introduce uh, Pauline uh, because you, you know much more about uh, Professor Sheldon. Uh, so Abe, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dean Wang, and welcome everybody, and especially uh, welcome Pauline uh, to the University of Central Florida Rosen College. It is a great honor and special pleasure for me to say a few words about Dr. Sheldon. Uh, I met Dr. Sheldon X years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Since she is a lady, I wouldn't discuss <laughs> things related to age. Uh, but she introduced me and introduced everybody else uh, to the Far East, to a whole new culture, to a whole new industry, to a whole new geographic area. Uh, she is not only a distinguished faculty member with a very extensive record of research and education, but most importantly, she is an innovator, a trailblazer, a person like no other at that time. I may say that she is simply responsible for creating Trinet with other colleagues as well, but most importantly for opening the Far East to those of us in the rest of the world. She worked closely with PATA Pacific Area Travel Association, and organized a series of seminars that faculty members from American universities will travel along the Pacific and teach the practice 
and the study of hospitality management. So I would dare to say that without her involvement in this particular venture, many of the current great schools of hospitality and tourism in the Far East and Oceania would not have existed because she had a foresight along with Dean Chuck G mm -hmm. to educate the future generation of academics in the Pacific area. And they listened to her, learned from her and created a whole new degree program, which did not exist at the time. She has written numerous articles, books, has served as an administrator and a leader, and of course, as a teacher. So we all learn from her, including myself. And she has been influential in Asia, in Australasia, in Europe, as well as in the United States. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Pauline Sheldon. Thank you. Thank you so much, Abe, for that very generous introduction. I can hardly say how delighted and honored I am to be here to celebrate your illustrious career because you have been ahead of me in many, many respects. And I wanna to touch a little bit on those before I get into my presentation, but a great thank you, uh, a great expression of gratitude to you for inviting me to contribute to this lecture series. So before I um, start, let me share my screen. Let's see here. Everybody see that okay? Okay, so before I start yep. on my uh, topic for today, which is looking to the future, which is something Abe has done very, very successfully, I thought I would just take a moment and uh, go back to the early 1970s. And at that time, Abe was completing his PhD at Cornell University 50 years ago, which is what we're celebrating here. I was a little pipsqueak in the UK, uh, finishing my bachelor's in mathematics in the University of Southampton. And little did we know that 50 years later, or a few years later at least, we would uh, path, cross paths. But you know, a recent conversation with Abe revealed that he and I actually started thinking about tourism at about the same time. There wasn't really much written at that time, but we both, found this book by Sir George Young, um, which was published by Pelican. I have it right here with me. I pulled it off my shelf called Tourism, Blessing or Blight. And I think both Abe and I were sort of stirred by the questions that this book raised. And um, it was for me anyway, the beginning of my commitment to delve into this fascinating industry, fascinating phenomenon. Uh, of tourism. And I think Abe must have been touched by it too, because he shared with me that that was one of his first, first readings. So we both went our various ways. Um, Abe started his uh, fantastic career. I moved to uh, the University of Hawaii and I found myself very isolated uh, in the middle of the Pacific. Um, and by the way, those of you who are younger, you may know that there were not many tourism academics at that time. And those that there were, we were scattered all over the place. And so I started thinking as the internet was starting to get going, how can we connect everybody, right? Um, so in 1988, I had this idea that uh, maybe we could sort of use this new thing called the internet to connect all the tourism researchers. So I went down to our computer center. They told me about this software called Listserv. I learned it. I connected with uh, a small group of, of academics at the time, Larry Dwyer in Australia, Chris Cooper in England, I think Rick Perdue in on the main. Anyway, there were a few of us and we played around with this and we started chatting and ex exchanging ideas because then there was no other way other than the telephone to talk. So we started and then 
magic happened. Um, at a TTRA conference in Hawaii, uh, I bumped into a good friend, Jafar Jafari, and I said to Jafar, we have this little thing going, do you think it has any legs? Do you think it'll be worthwhile for the tourism community? And Jafar, in his wonderful, wonderful supportive way, said yes, and he helped to get this thing moving. And so we put out some announcements about Trinet, and, and slowly people started to, 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 to get it. Now, I think, you know, it's become quite a connectivity. There are almost 4,000 subscribers in 81 countries who are part of Trinet. And uh, a lot of them are in the English speaking world, but we're seeing people in Lesotho, in uh, Bulgaria, all over the world. So, so that was the beginning of starting to get connected and aid uh, was part of that uh, online community. So <clears throat> let me hark on a little bit about uh, Hawaii. So I, I, here I am at the University of Hawaii under the guidance of uh, Dean Chuck G. He was a phenomenal dean and much of what Abe just attributed to me in terms of opening up China, it was certainly Chuck G that was the trailblazer I just followed along. Um, but he built our school to be one of the finest. Um, we were one of the first UNWTO uh, research and policy centers. And as Abe said, he opened up China and Pacific and, and, and our edit program. But it was in the year 2000 where Chuck G decided to retire um, that I took on the deanship from uh, Chuck. And that was, I believe, the same year, Abe, was it not, that you took on the deanship of uh, Rosen College. And I think it was there where we started to interact more in our deanship roles. Um, I didn't last in the deanship very long. I decided I would prefer the, the, the academic life. So I went back to faculty after four years, but you went on to do the incredible work that you did to build the most amazing at Rosen College. So congratulations to you for staying the course. I, I certainly uh, didn't do anything at the administrative level as you did. Okay, um, so <clears throat> that's a little bit of background on how and I, Abe and I, have, our paths have been parallel, but I'd like to move on to uh, the topic that I've chosen for today, which is something we're all thinking about, I think. You know, here we are in this incredible inflection point uh, in society, uh, in tourism, uh, where we're having to rethink things. And I would like to mention uh, one of Abe's pieces here. He wrote an amazing piece in the year 2000 uh, on life and tourism in 2050. So he has been a forward looking thinker for many, many years. And um, I, I know he has a lot to say and I'm going to reference his article as we go through this presentation. But we are facing something of such a massive proportion uh, that we all are trying to come to grips with it. And I like to begin our thinking with a quote that I find very helpful. And this is a quote from Urandati Roy, an Indian writer and activist. And, and she says this, she says, historically pandemics have forced humans to break with the past and imagine their world anew. This one is no different. It's a portal between one world and the next. So our choice is we can walk through it dragging the old stuff, the carcasses of our avarice, our dead ideas behind us, or we can walk through lightly with little luggage to imagine another world. So I'd like to just share with you first what I think is the luggage that we need to leave behind because certain things have really been there to build tourism to the state it was with all the over tourism before the pandemic hit. And I think there are things that we need to reevaluate. And it's the economic system upon which tourism was built that I think is up for reevaluation. And the assumptions of that economic system are certainly questionable. Let's go through a few of them. Uh, there was the assumption that if we act on self interest, it'll drive ideal human behavior. I think we all feel now that that certainly hasn't led us uh, to the best state on this planet Earth. Um, the economic system that drove so much tourism encouraged consumption for its own sake, over consumption, over tourism. It believed that competition was really what led economic progress. Uh, collaboration and sharing was really not part of the model. It also believed that markets are fair and prices tell the truth. We know that's not the case. The externalities are not put into the price and the costing of so many goods and services. And so that's a fallacy. 
The other idea that more in income equals more happiness. Well, to a certain degree, we know that's true, but after we have our basic needs met, that is certainly questionable also. And the one that bothered me when I was doing my PhD in economics, this is the thing that bothered me the most, is that the economic system seemed to be blind to any human values. And there are many, many other assumptions. This was all bundled together under the name neoliberalism, the economic system that came to us after World War II, and many are saying it's due for, to go into the dustbin of history. Um, one of my favorite authors, Naomi Klein, in her wonderful book, This Changes Everything, said that we need to drop our addiction to pure free market ideologies, put an end to the greed and corporate power and restructure our local economies and strengthen our democracies. So that is one piece of baggage that I think we need to drop as we move through the portal into a new world. The other one is our addiction to growth. You know, we're so used to looking at charts like this over the last decades, aren't we? You know, 3% growth, 2% growth, 5% growth, and ever never ending growth. We're looking at GDP growth, growth in visitor arrivals, expenditure growth. But can we take a break? Well, we've been forced to take a break, right? And it's so interesting, you know, I think there's an analogy that is relevant here. And that analogy is the coming of age. You know, as we grow up as individuals, we go through our adolescence and then we reach a point where growth of the physical body doesn't happen anymore, right? The energy that drives the human system no longer goes into physical growth. It goes inward to create a different view of life, a different set of values and a different sense of responsibility. And I would like to suggest that tourism is now needing to come of age. Um, the, the overconsumption, the recklessness of some of our industry, not all of it, but much of our industry is now needing to self-reflect. It's been sent to its room <laughs> and to come up with a new set of values. And so what we're looking at now is not growth of all those uh, numerical physical things, but growth of responsibility, growth of concern for well-being, health, education of our destinations, of our ecosystems, and a general concern for the greater good. And here again, Abe was a trailblazer. Um, I was reading his article, Life and Tourism in 2050, and look what Abe said way back then in 20 years ago. He said, individuals and organizations have the obligation to enhance the welfare and the interests of society. He said, a balance between humanity and nature, between mind and body were necessary. So good on you, Abe, you were right on uh, with I think what I think uh, needs to happen. Okay, so dropping the addiction to growth is also necessary. So then we're left with the question, where do we place our value in the future as we start to redesign economic systems upon which tourism can be built? And I think the key thing here is to recognize the heterogeneity of capitals. Instead of there just being financial capital, which is what we can easily measure and look towards the growth of, we need to consider all of these other capitals, the social capital, the networks that we build, our relationships, compassion, kindness, gentleness, the natural capital of the environment, the flora, the fauna, intellectual capital, creativity, trust, experiential capital, spiritual and cultural capital. And I think when we start to bring all of these capitals into the decision making and the transactions in tourism, we start to be able to have the foundation to build a new world. So what are these new economic structures that tourism can learn from? Because over the last decades, there have been many economists who have looked at how we can start bringing human values into the study of economics. Way back to 1973, when Schumacher wrote his wonderful book, Small is Beautiful, Economics as if People uh, Mattered, um, he started it. And then in about 1983, the uh, new economic analysis, uh, excuse me, alliance was created. And as recently as in 2019, uh, our Nobel laureate, Joseph Stiglitz, with a number of esteemed economists put their heads to this issue and came up with that wonderful book, uh, Measuring What Matters, where he totally redefined uh, the use of uh, economics for studying capital. So what I'd like to do is quickly talk about six different economic structures that I think have huge potential for taking us forward in our thinking for uh, tourism. The first one, of course, is the collaborative economy. Uh, this is well known in tourism, a collaborative or sharing economy. Uh, this challenges the issue of ownership 
and brings about the sharing of resources and the relationships upon which those resources are shared. So social capital and trust capital become very important. This economy of creativity, which values uh, the capitals of intellectual capital, uh, creativity, and so on. And um, we measure the success of an economy of creativity by the amount of innovation, diversity, and progress uh, that is, is, is brought about in society. There's the circular economy, uh, which is focused on natural resources, maximizing their use, recycling, minimizing waste, and there are many examples already in tourism where the circular economy is starting to take a hold. And as, as uh, our resources become more and more precious, uh, this is going to be more important. Another economy that I find fascinating is the sacred economy. This is where the spiritual values of a society are uh, given great weight and the interconnectedness of all of us humans and our interconnectedness with nature becomes important. I'd highly recommend Charles Eisenstein's book on this. He's a brilliant thinker and lays out in a lot of detail the tenets of a sacred economy. Um, another economy is the gift economy or the economy of generosity. And this calls upon many of the human values to build it. And it's something that really counterpoints uh, the economy of greed that we could say has driven much economic activity in the past. And finally, the regenerative economy. Um, this really was born out of regenerative agriculture where the idea of you know regenerating the soil and, and, and having the plants grow more successfully. Here we're looking at using economic activity or tourism to build back or to regenerate. It goes beyond sustainability. You know, sustainable tourism has been part of what we've talked about for so many years, but regeneration is going beyond that and saying how we can contribute uh, to the resources, the cultural, the environmental resources of a destination. So these are just uh, touching on some of the, the new ways of looking at economic structures. I'd like to focus on three, the creativity, uh, the generosity and the regenerative economy, give a couple of examples and uh, move on from there. So first one I wanted to talk about is the creative economy, because I think in tourism, we have still a lot of work to do to redefine tourism work, to redefine tourism education. Um, there's so much of, of um, what we do in tourism in terms of the way we educate that is, is buying into the production model. We're just educating people to go into, you know, corporations as frontline uh, staff. And there's so much more potential. And once again, a Professor Pizam was a trailblazer here. Uh, he is more than anybody I know, creative, innovative, and has brought his skills, uh, not only to creating the Rosen College and, and thinking through human resource development in tourism, but I was reading uh, an interview he gave uh, recently, and he said two very interesting things. He said, my passion, my first passion is the desire to create something from nothing, that, that creativity, he's always valued it, and having the freedom uh, to be uh, enterprising. So, you know, that's who Abe is, and his contributions have been huge. Um, he's written two very, very interesting pieces looking at the characteristics of innovators uh, and innovation-based economies. Uh, and so Graeber certainly moved the field forward. I think we have a lot more work to do to build on the work uh, that Abe has done. About uh, 15 years ago, um, I was at a TTRA conference uh, and was chatting with Dan Fessenmeyer, who many of you may know, and uh, we were sort of thinking through about how at that time, 15 years ago, our programs throughout the world in tourism were not addressing the future that our tourism students would be moving into. And we decided that we needed to really give this some attention. So we created something called the Tourism Education Futures Initiative, or TEFI. Um, it is still continuing. With, uh, it's done a lot of good work. And the idea was, you know, we need to educate tourism change makers, um, people to, to enliven that creativity in uh, how we address tourism's contribution to the world, to society, instead of just being in the production mode. So we tried to envision the future of tourism education. We all came together um, with Charlie Berber at, uh, in Modo University in, in Vienna. 
And we tried to imagine different scenarios as Abe did his, in, in his article into the decades of the future. And you know, it was not easy. You know, we imagine what would it be if we went back to subsistence economies? What would it be like if corporations around the world and so on and so on, we dreamed up all of these crazy different scenarios. But what it came down to was whatever the scenario is as the future unfolds, if we come back to the basic human values of courage, of honesty, integrity, kindness, then an education system based on that would be well-founded to move us into the future. And so Teffy continues, I highly recommend if you don't know it, uh, there's a huge amount of um, literature on the curriculum models uh, based on uh, a values-based education. Okay, so creativity, the economy of creativity has a lot to offer us moving forward. What about the economy of generosity? I think there's huge potential here. Um, as we try to let go of the baggage of greed and replace it with generosity, there's a huge amount of neuroscience that supports this move. Many of you may know that when we're greedy and, and grasping things for ourselves, uh, a chemical called dopamine is created in the system. When we're generous and we care for others and give to others, we get the serotonin, which is that long-term good feeling of goodness. And so uh, there's a great uh, uh, recognition that people who are generous uh, live healthier, longer lives. So what does it mean to be generous? I highly recommend a, a TED talk I absolutely love called Designing for Generosity by Nippon Mehta. And he analyzes what it is that needs to happen in an economy, the shift from focusing on consumption to contribution, from transaction to trust, from isolation to the community, and a whole debate on scarcity to abundance. What does abundance really mean? What is enough? You know, do we really need that second car, that third television set, or that fifth vacation, you know, if, if, we, if we can redefine what is abundance. But the interesting thing is that as we start to generate a circulation of gifts throughout an economy, uh, then networks are created and we can start to build a new economy. So I asked the question, what would tourism look like if we were to design for generosity? And there are many, many examples already, and I only have time to briefly touch on them. Intrepid Travel is a tour operator that has a program where when you purchase your tour package, you can also purchase a small vacation for a disadvantaged child in your destination. They facilitate that. They put the infrastructure there. The city of Amsterdam has a, an amazing on-tourist guide where they design generosity experiences for visitors who want to go fishing for plastic in the canals and uh, pull it out and help. Many, many examples. There's a, a restaurant chain that is hugely successful in all the big cities of the world called Karma Kitchen, which has zero on your bill after you've eaten. You pay it forward. This idea of paying it forward is fundamental to the idea of recipro reciprocity. But the one I love the most it's very simple. Uh, it's an example, a, a hotel in Cambodia, Shintamani in Siem Reap. When you go and check into, into a hotel there, into the hotel room, then what you get on your uh, little um, bedside table is a generosity menu. And what it is, is a delineation of ways that you can contribute to the local community and you can decide to do it, whether it's $40 to give a bicycle to a family or $900 US to uh, buy a little home for a family or even a bag of rice. You know, you decide what you want to do. The hotel takes you to the village so you can meet the family. And guess what? This hotel has the highest occupancy rates, the highest repeat visitation because people come back over and over to see how they, uh, their gift has uh, influenced the family and relationships are built. So I think huge potential uh, for generosity. The last one I'd like to uh, touch on, which I'm very excited about these days I'm writing in, is the area of regenerative uh, economy in tourism, regenerative uh, tourism. And I wanted to talk about this in the context of what's happening right now in Hawaii, where I'm sitting. You know, with the pandemic, it's been a very, very interesting response uh, from our resident population. Of course, there's been the loss of jobs, which has been very difficult, but so many residents are finally breathing that they can really live their normal life again without the over-tourism that was experienced before. 
right? I don't know if this has happened in Florida, but um, we, we are experiencing a resurgence of people wanting a different kind of tourism, a tourism that contributes to society, contributes rather than uh, abuses it. And so we've had a sequence of activities building this regenerative approach to tourism. Um, over the last few months post pandemic, uh, a very strong community based initiative started called Aina Aloha Economic Futures. Aina in Hawaiian means land, Aloha means to care for. Um, and this is a, a very rigorous program over the last weeks and months trying to look at what a regenerative economic future would look like. And of course, there are many dimensions to this. It has to do with agriculture. It has to do with energy sources and so on, technology. But it also has to do with how we relate to tourism. And I am so excited to tell you that today, this afternoon, it's morning here in Hawaii, but this afternoon, there is a bill being heard at our state Senate on adopting a regenerative approach to tourism. And um, that is happening as we speak. And I put in some testimony yesterday, and I'm hoping that this will move forward. The other exciting thing, um, in addition to having that huge community input to, to our future economic uh, structure, is the new leadership we have um, at the Hawaii Tourism Authority. Um, an amazing gentleman by the name of John DeFries, who is a native Hawaiian who was born in Waikiki uh, before there was were any hotels uh, who is full of integrity, is steeped in the native Hawaiian values, he is now leading uh, our design of tourism moving forward. And he's putting into place some phenomenal programs. Um, many of you, when you think of Hawaii, you think perhaps aloha, you know, that welcome, that greeting, which we still have. But there are two other very important values that John is bringing to the fourth. Uh, one is malama. And malama is that beautiful Hawaiian value of caring for things, of, of looking after, having respect for caring. And he has put in place in the last few months, some of you may have read about it, a program where visitors, when they come to Hawaii, they can be given an extra free night in a hotel if they will spend a day either somehow physically giving back through working with the land, learning with the native Hawaiians about their culture and so on and so forth. Um, so it, it's a program that's, that's building in for it, into its infrastructure, a way for us all to care for the land, to care for the culture. The other um, value is kuleana. And Kuliana is about responsibility, taking responsibility. And that's what I spoke about earlier, this idea, this analogy that tourism is coming of age, the need for the industry to take care of um, the assets upon which it is built. And there are programs being developed there. So <clears throat> this is something that's, that's in progress right now in our islands, and I, I'll keep you posted. Um, but Having looked at those very quickly, those six uh, different possible economic um, mo models, I would like to go back to Abe. Because you know what? <clears throat> Abe in his writings has cap encapsulated a lot of what I spoke about. If you look at Abe's predictions for the transformation of tourism into the, the years ahead, I've pulled a few of them together here and I would like to read them out. He talked about the tourism as a way of discovering life's meaning, a decline in the consumer culture he saw in tourism, an increase in spirituality, an increase in the desire to explore into connectivity in morality and holism with low impact lifestyles, vegetarian diets and anti-materialistic ethics. So Abe, congratulations, you were ahead of your time. And I think what you envisioned years ago um, is what we are needing to see come to fruition. And I think all of us on this call, all tourism scholars need to start thinking about how are we going to design this new tourism? And before I finish, I'd just like to briefly touch on uh, an article I recently published on designing tourism experiences for this inner transformation that has to happen. 
Yeah, it, it's it's about the inner world of tourism, the adult really reflecting on what are the values, what are the responsibilities we have. And I don't have time to go into this in, in any detail other than to say that tourism, I believe, has a huge potential to lead us in society towards something more thoughtful and more reflective. So I'd like to end by saying a huge thank you or mahalo in Hawaii to a Professor A. Pizam. And I think those econ economic structures I briefly touched on, every one of them you display, your collaboration, your innovation, your creativity, your generosity, and your vision. Thank you so much, Abe, for your incredible contribution to our wonderful world of tourism scholarship. Okay, do we have questions or? Yeah, before, before I ask the questions on Sheldon, Abe, is there anything, you, you, you have some nice citations in there from Dr. Sheldon. Have you any thoughts before we open to the floor? He's muted. You're muted, Abe. Yeah, Abe, you're muted. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sheldon. I appreciate uh, you quoting me. Um, it was a great pleasure to write that particular article. I've always been a fan of science fiction from my childhood. And I read every single science fiction that I could get my hands on. And I envisioned a day where our world will be better and the hospitality and tourism industry will help create a better world. So, with great pleasure, I wrote that particular article envisioning a world where greed and lack of concern for humanism and human values will no longer exist. I hoped that my prediction will come through, and I still hope so. But from time to time, I'm a little bit discouraged as it was in the last four years, but we won't go into that very much. So thank you very much for that. And I still hope that my prediction and yours as well will come true in the not too far future. Lovely, thank you very much indeed, Abe. Um, Pauline, I've got a question from my good colleague, Denver Sievert, who is very, very happy to welcome you to the Rosen College. Um, I'm going to, Denver, I'm going to turn your question to the, the, the area of regenerative travel, Pauline, where you finished on. Do you think industry, academia, and researchers can come together and move that agenda forward? Or do you think it's, are we going to be able to move that agenda on as a whole? Or do you think it's going to be sort of smaller bits moving forward? Uh, how do you see everyone coming together? Yeah, I think that's an excellent question. You know, <clears throat> there is no hesitation in my answer is we have to come together. This cannot be done piecemeal. And that's one of the tenets of regen regenerative tourism is that we, we do systemic thinking. We don't think in silos. We don't think of the industry as something separate from society. And that's one of the problems I think we've had in the past, you know. So, so the need to come together to use systemic thinking, to look to nature for models and this huge amount of knowledge in natural systems that, that we, can, we can build, but collaboration and working together is absolutely critical. And it may well be that, um, you know, academics need to sort of lead the way forward, but regenerative tourism is, is very interesting because it does need us to ask deep questions. Uh, but it needs everybody to give the answer. And the answer is there, you know, in, in the dialogue between the residents, the industry, academia, and everybody. So if we can all look at the value of being systemic and collaborative, I think uh, we'll move forward much more quickly. Lovely. Thank you, Paul. And a related question for one of our PhD students, Maxim. You talk about transformation for the industry. Do you see a scenario where tourism will facilitate transformation of local residents who, oh. clearly, have, who clearly have been on the receiving end for some of the more negative aspects? Yes, yes, yes. Um, I do, 
but I do think it's in the context of this regenerative model that I've been talking about. And it's, it, it really needs to move to the place where tourism activity transforms everything for the good. And if it doesn't, it has no place, right? So it can transform tourists. We all know that through their, you know, more expensive experiences and education and so on, but it has to be for the residents. And, you know, in Hawaii, one of the people who works with John DeFries is a native Hawaiian Kalani, and he talks a lot about the importance of in destinations, of the, the, the residents welcoming the visitors back and you know, not just sort of hiding away, being the workers in the destination, but they're the ones that offer the welcome and they're the ones that really gain the benefit, not just economically. We know that this, you know, that's always been the argument for tourism all over the world. You know, it's, it's the panacea, right? Bring in tourism, you get more money, more jobs. But we all know that the jobs have to transform and, and the life, it's the quality of life of the resident that is so important. Um, yeah, so, and I touch on that in that article, the Annals article I referenced earlier. Lovely, and, and the question he refers to that article, so, so, so that's good. And just a, a sort of related question, because I know you've always had a passion for technology over the years, and my good friend Dimitros Bahalas has always talked technology with you. What role can technology play in this transformative phase? Hmm, that's a very good question. You know, <clears throat> I always thought years ago when I was, um, you know, studying IT and tourism, that technology would get to a place where it was almost invisible, you know, um, like, like electricity. We don't see it, but we enjoy the benefits. <laughs> and I think technology is here to stay. There's absolutely no question about it. Um, it's hugely transformed our industry and it continues to make contributions, even as we look at sustainability. Um, Andy Fru did some work on looking at technology's impact on the sustainable development of tourism. But the connectivity that it brings, I think, is one of the values that you cannot replace in any other way, as we're learning <laughs> with Zoom uh, over this last year. And so because tourism is a connected industry, you know, face to face in the past and, and, and technology is a connected industry electronically, um, it's got to play a role going forward. Um, but it is having to be curtailed a little bit. I don't know if any of you saw some recent um, ads that New Zealand has been putting out. They are very, very uh, much in the forefront of developing regenerative tourism in New Zealand, but they are very worried about tourists that go there and they all want to take the selfie on the same spot. And so those little sweet spots are getting uh, um, overcrowded and so on and so forth. So they actually have a video that uh, is dramatizing sort of the selfie police as if you, you know, they go to these and make sure people aren't just doing the same old thing, go and explore different parts. So one of the side effects that isn't so good of technology, I think, is that it has, you know, led everybody to the, to the same sweet spots. I mean, here on Hawaii, we have an incredibly beautiful beach called uh, Lanakai on the Windward side. And I always used to go there when I wanted to get away from everything but then it was discovered and everybody was, you know, Twittering and Facebooking about it. And now it's as crowded as Waikiki. So, you know, it's, it's, it's played a role and not always a good role. But I think it, technology is no worse or better than the minds that use it. And so, you know, that transformation that I'm talking about in terms of our consciousness and our value system, you know, if we can work on that, then the way we use technology will, will, will be good. And it has the power for good. There's no question about it. Alan, can I have a follow-up question? Yes, yes, of course. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Sheldon for, uh, for your wonderful talk. Uh, you know, at least as far as I'm concerned, this is really inspiring. And, uh, uh, you know, some of the topics really make us, uh, you know, uh, think a, a lot, you know, about, about the future. And of course, you focus a lot of uh, things, uh, future-oriented, you know, uh, new paradigms, new economy, and new direction for tourism, tour tourism development, right? And, uh, you know, but if you if you look at you know the practices you know throughout the world and uh, it is usually the, the 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 developing countries or economies who started with some kinds of innovative ways or different ways or different approach uh, to economic development you know so for example if you look at countries like uh, Bhutan, Nepal you know more than ten years ago they have replaced the GDP driven uh, growth approach. 
uh, you know, by the uh, gross national happiness, you know. So yeah. that is really something which which will be counted for, you know, in the very end. It's well, it's about the well-being of the people, the well-being of the society, and including the environment. It's about the happiness of that, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and then the developing developed countries are usually kind of laggards or followers, you know. And once yeah. something's created, and then you know they will follow, they will advocate, but not necessarily, for example, reflected by their practices. And if you look at the behavior and the practice. It is still, you know, new, you know, economic, you know, development model mm -hmm. uh, in which, you know, productivity is the king and mm -hmm. in which, you know, greed is very, very rampant, right? So yeah. that is one side of my, my question is that, you know, how can we advocate this new approaches or new mindset for, 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 for future development, right? Yeah. And then at a different level, uh, from an educational perspective, I enjoy your, your viewpoints about value-based education, right? Uh, but the challenge is that you know, we all understand the importance of that. The challenge is that, you know, how can you integrate, you know, all these different kinds of um, uh, mindsets and scenarios into the curriculum mm -hmm. so that, you know, students can actually eventually get it so that they can bring this into, their, into the workforce. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dean Wang. That's uh, two deep questions there. I'm going to ask, answer them in reverse order. So <clears throat> the, the last question about bringing them into the educational system. Um, <clears throat> the Tefi group, a number of years ago, I think it was after you came to Hawaii, we met in Switzerland. And we put a lot of thought into actual curriculum design, putting, you know, learning objectives into courses, you know, designing specific courses around these value sets. So that is a, a body of knowledge that's already out there. And uh, um, uh, Kathy Sue with the Journal of Teaching, Travel and Tourism, she put some special issues out on uh, this curriculum design uh, issue. It's a very important thing you're bringing up, but, um, and we only made a start at it, of course, there's a lot more work to do, but I, you know, I would have to say, that, um, you know, I think students are seeking this, they're hungry for this new kind of education. You know, they want more meaningful approaches to understanding knowledge. So I think, you know, that's, that's um, uh, what I would say to that. To the other question <clears throat> about uh, Bhutan, gross national happiness and so on, you know, that's a very interesting example because that was so successful in Bhutan because it was rooted in a, a culture, a, a spiritual culture. You know, Buddhism is extremely strong in Bhutan. And so that value set, people live their spirituality there. And so it was, it was easy uh, to uh, adopt that. Uh, it's harder for us to adopt that in, in uh, a more secular society, such as the US or most Western countries. However, one of the things that I think is really critical as we move forward and try to embody, you know, these values that we've been talking about is to identify people who are passionate to make the change. I call them bridge builders. They're sort of the builder, the bridge between the old paradigm and the new paradigm, whether they're students, whether they're researchers or whether they're industry. And there are some in all of those places. Find them and support them you know, give them the research money, you know, give the students the scholarships, those who mm -hmm. are, you know, already trying to grapple with how to bring these values onto the ground. Um, they, we have to support them as bridge builders because that's how we get from one paradigm to the new paradigm. And one critical group that I see um, very important in the transformation of tourism in the future are social entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. I wrote a book on this a, a few years ago with Roberto Danielli. And um, these are people who they want success in, in tourism in the real world, and they want to live their values and do it through their values so that profit, yes, but secondary to well being of society. And so, if we can create more social entrepreneurship programs, um, I think we'll move a, a long way forward in, uh, in designing a better tourism. I hope I answered your question. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Can I jump on the back of that, uh, Pauline, because I've seen a number of questions on a related theme and I can see one from Claire Haven Tang from um, Cardiff. And it relates to the teaching of tourism in Hawaii. You've gone into a management or business school. How do you get that values driven education in a lot of colleges that are so dominantly management driven? Yeah. How, how do you do that? 
well, <clears throat> you pull out and become independent and have a more social science approach. <laughs> no, no, um, that's my rather cynical response. I'm sorry. How you do it within the context of being in a business school, um, it all lands on the on the faculty. You know, <clears throat> uh, it depends to what degree um, you have autonomy over your curriculum. Um, if you have autonomy over your curriculum, then of course, you know, you can design your course around these things that we've been, we've been talking about. Um, if you do not have autonomy over your curriculum, if it's the business dean and the business faculty that are dictating what you're teaching, um, and your degree is so merged that, you know, there's no time to get into these kind of issues, then it's a ser serious problem. Um, but if, if that were to be the case, I would, if I were the dean, I would make sure that every hire I made was somebody who espoused and lived these values and was committed to doing that in the classroom. Mm -hmm. And maybe it has to be done in an extracurricular way, you know, service internships, um, you know, different things outside of the curriculum can be done through honorary societies. We have a, an, you know, Ada Sigma Delta, we, we have a chapter in Hawaii. And even since um, we've been part of the uh, business school, I, I've introduced them to one of the native Hawaiian leaders and they're starting to uh, mentor them. So look extracurricular um, if you have to. Uh, but uh, get the right faculty and uh, just don't let go of it and try to be, you know, there's no reason why tourism can't lead business. You know, it's such a shame to see and define tourism as a business, as a piece of business. And that's, that's what's the danger. And that's the, the rationale, of course, for making them part of the business school. Mm -hmm. But it should be the other way around. Tourism is so much bigger, so much more complex. And it should be leading the thinking and business is just a piece of it. You know, I used to dream that, you know, tourism would be a, the umbrella discipline under which business and psychology <laughs> things <laughs> lay, because as Abe knows, it's such an interdisciplinary field of study. And, and Pauline, I have to, I have to refer to Dimitros, who's got a question. He says, hi from, from Bournemouth. Um, how can maybe the, the new ideas of, of tourism that you speak of, how can they be used maybe to kickstart tourism in places like Bali, Kenya, Thailand, that clearly are suffering hugely uh, at the moment? That, how, how can they be, you know, there may be a longer term agenda, but what can they do to re-energize tourism at the moment? Well, well you know, <clears throat> there's no question that the pandemic has given us time to sit and think and do this redesign. And so we can't go back to business as it was. Even if, you know, COVID disappeared tomorrow, we still cannot go back to business as it was because it was already destructive, you know. So, so my answer to Demetrius, hi Demetrius, is that we really have to go slowly. You know, we can't expect things to, to develop right away. We've got to use the values, do the redesign with some sincerity, you know, uh, and, 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 and really define experiences for tourists, define new jobs for um, the, the residents and come up with something a lot more creative uh, than it was in the past. And, and it's hard, you know, if I go down to Waikiki and I see these, you know, 6,000 room hotels that are mostly empty, you've got to scratch your head and say, what the heck's going to happen? Well, maybe, what we have to do is take the bottom three floors of that hotel and turn it into a wellness center or a cultural learning center. You know, we, we have to work with the infrastructure we have and put those values into place. Um, and it means that corporations have to, you know, redefine uh, their value system too. It's not just the bottom line for, for uh, shareholders, it's the well-being of all stakeholders. And um, it's gonna take a lot of adjustment by the big corporations, but many of them, uh, are espousing mission statements and vision statements that speak to the greater good. And so now it's a chance for them to creatively um, put that into, into play. It's Lovely. a hard one though. It's not going to be easy, I would say. Yeah. Lovely. Thank you. I think my colleague Tico, looking at you. Yes, I, I, I was listening very carefully because I, um, I may have a, another view of, of tourism in the sense that I work with a lot of poor countries and poor neighborhoods. So while I like your idea of transforming things, and I'm, I mean, I read uh, Schumacher back and forth, uh, um, but still working with poor people and wellness, 
it seems to me more for developed countries where they have reached a certain you know, level of income and happiness in, or satisfaction with life compared to countries like Kenya and Africa, or, or if I go to, I mean, places in Ecuador, Brazil, where people are really, I mean, living, they, they're hungry, they need jobs. So if they can get one penny in order to survive, they would, you know, be, they felt at least physically satisfied. Yeah. So it is that, that combination of a world and it's the same thing with a human being, with, which is a little, it, it is com complex. I mean, a human is both greedy and, 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 and providing, giving gift out to people. So that generosity, so it's a, a, the holistic part of the person. So how can we really put it all together in these different scenarios of the world? Yeah, that's a great question, Tico. And it's a slide I had to pull out because I didn't think I'd have time to cover it. <laughs> but it, it deals with this issue you know, of growth. And in the less developed countries, you know, there's this um, balance point that we need between uh, social justice, economic well-being, and environmental protection. You know, it's it's, and the, the person that I find most stimulating when I try to get my head around what you're asking me is Kate Rayworth. She's an Oxford economist, and she has designed uh, an economic system called Donut Economics, and uh, she she draws a donut and um, with a hole in it, and it's it's you know below that certain level in the hole. We're not meeting the needs, as you were talking, the socioeconomic needs of the poorer people. But if we go beyond that level of economic activity, then we're destroying the atmosphere and, 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 and the environment. So, so it's finding that balance point. And she describes it like a donut. There's a, there's a certain uh, uh, area uh, that ideal socioeconomic behavior happens where all three of the resources are taken into consideration. And of course, developing countries are dealing with it at a different level than developed ones are. But I would have to say, and, and, and Dean Wang touched on this in his question, is that we have a lot to learn from developing countries. You know, in, in as, as we design, we've got to go smaller. You know, we've got to go simpler. I think most of all of us have, uh, over the last year have started to live simpler lives, right? Um, I'm growing my own garden. I never had time to because I was traveling all around. You know, so a more simple life is what you know um, native peoples know to do very well. They're in tune with nature. They understand how to live uh, a simpler life, and we have to learn from them. So um, this idea that developed nations have all the answers uh, it has to change. I think. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Abe, uh, I gave you the last word before we adjourn, so. Thank you. Uh, all right, so the question that I have in my mind, and I would like you to try to answer it, I'm all for transformation. And I believe in a world that will be transformed. But the question in my mind is evolution versus revolution. I tend to think that human history has shown that there are some watershed events in its history which turn it around in terms of values, in terms of new directions, rather than bit by bit. So Charles Darwin was right in terms of human physical evolution on the environment, but I think that in terms of the social cultural rev evolution, so to speak, we need some crisis that will occur and turn the direction into a different place. My personal opinion, I'd like to hear yours on that issue. I, I would agree uh, mostly, Abe, and I think this is the crisis. <laughs> I think this is the crisis. Um, how long it continues and whether we learn our lessons is yet to be seen. Because if we don't, I think there'll be a bigger crisis. So I'm totally in line with you. However, I would like to add another uh, perspective. Uh, I have a good colleague here in Hawaii, Elizabeth Satora. She's a, a biologist. And her work is studying how species always self-correct. You know, you talked about the evolutionary process. 
you know, when you look at, you know, how different species, they, they go through this internal self-correction mechanism. And I think we as humans, as the most intelligent species on the planet, probably will do the same. So that's why I'm optimistic. Um, we may have to go through some big bumps. This is certainly a big bump right now. Uh, climate change, we haven't even touched on in this talk. I think that's an even bigger bump than, 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 than uh, COVID. And I think COVID is sort of a, a training ground for, for, for climate change. And tourism, of course, is a huge uh, uh, problem and uh, a recipient of, of climate change issues. But uh, we're not done. And I think planet Earth is very wise. And planet Earth is going to shake us up until we get to do it right. And I think this is, a, 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 you know, this coming of age I mentioned, I think we still got quite a way to go. We're just coming out of our teenagehood. But <laughs> with we're wise people like you, Abe, and everybody else on this call, I think together we can, we can do it. And really, you know, my plea would be to really, really harness tourism to its full potential to make these changes. It's about so many aspects of, the, of life, you know, interpersonal connectivity, you know, it's, it's, it, it has such potential to change the world. And we have hardly scratched the surface of that. So that's what I would ask is that we all kind of turn our research endeavors towards how we can make tourism be the lead uh, in so socioeconomic change. The catalyst. So, uh, at this point, I would like to conclude this interesting session thanking you for attending and a very special thanks to Dr. Pauline Sheldon for her wonderful and very insightful um, talk today. We will see each other again at our next Abraham Pizam Distinguished Lecture Series on March 25th, 2021. So this year, of course, at 4 p.m. Eastern time, New York time and 10 a.m. New Zealand, mm -hmm. because we have our guest uh, speaker that day, Dr. Chris Ryan, Professor of Tourism Management at the University of Waikato, um, New Zealand. So thank you so much. Please stay safe until the next time.